Locked On Podcast Network and Odyssey present Locked On Sports Today. Yesterday was the start of a new era for the Pittsburgh Steelers. What exactly are these Baltimore Ravens? And the Kansas City Chiefs look the part once again of Super Bowl contenders. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. I'm Peter Bukowski, starting your day with the can't miss stories and biggest debates in sports. You're locked on sports today. Searching all major sports. Found. Let's start with the biggest story. Kenny Pickett made his debut for the Pittsburgh Steelers on Sunday against the New York Jets, and not a single pass that he threw hit the ground. He was 10 of 13. Now, the other three went to the Jets, and the Jets won the game 24 to 20. But that is potentially going to be a side note in history because it looks like this is going to be a chance for him to take over the Pittsburgh Steelers franchise. Joining me now from Locked On Steelers, Chris Carter and Chris do you see this as that momentous when this happened? Was that your in- inclination? Like, okay, it's over for Mitch Trubisky. I mean, if you're Mike Tomlin, how do you go back to Mitch Trubisky at this point unless Kenny Pickett has a really bad game? I, I said this all leading up to this season. None of these quarterbacks are above reproach or being benched. Uh, you, know, I, you know, Ben Roethlisberger was that guy for a very long time. Sure. But, you know, Kenny Pickett's a rookie right now, and they're going to let him be a rookie and let him learn. Mitch Trubisky was brought in to be a veteran. He, he was doing the job of not turning the ball over, but he wasn't doing the job of making enough plays when they were there. Um, and it's funny, Peter. I actually thought what he was doing in the first half, he was actually giving his, his offense some chances. Uh, you know, he had a drop from Deontay Johnson that was intercepted. Uh, he threw a pass to Deontay Johnson. He couldn't get his second toe down. Um, funny enough, we're talking about the same guy there. Uh, but you know, I actually thought he wasn't, this was the, this was the least incompetent he has seen in a game. Um, you know, trying to put it, trying to put it in a way that makes sense. Uh, Damn but fame praise there, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not exactly, <laughs> you know, coming out heavy for him, but when Kenny Pickett took over, first of all, let me tell you the environment, when you see number eight run onto the field in Pittsburgh, it was just yes. the whole stadium was just like, oh, this is crazy. This is what we want. And, I mean, every first down, like he just one time he rolled out on third down and, and just got a first down, it was like they exploded like it was a touchdown. And I was like, this is this is craziness. What is what is happening? Uh, but what you could see every time he took – Kenny Pickett took the huddle, every time he took a snap, there was a command. He knew where he was going. He was processing. He even called an, an adjustment at the line of scrimmage, which we hadn't seen too much of for Mitch Trubisky. Um he sees the field so much better. And, and even though, yes, three interceptions, and I know if you didn't watch the game, you probably think, well, Chris, that's terrible. One interception clanged off the hands of Chase Claypool. The other interception clanged off the hands of Pat Fryer. With The other interception was a Hail Mary attempt that they just do at the end of the game. You know, and the fra- the Pat Fryer move one, I will say, he shouldn't have thrown it. He even said, I was trying to throw it away. I should have thrown it higher so he didn't go get it. And that was more so that. But he knew where he was going each time. He understood the defense. Mr. Trubisky has been guessing for three and a half games. You'll take that over to that any day. I have to ask you about the swagger because I noticed that watching it live too. Like Kenny Pickett plays with a swagger that you would kind of expect a top five pick in Mitch Trubisky to play with, but he he never really has. How much of that did you see in camp? How much of that contributed to him being a guy who was the fans were calling for to come in? How, how much of that did you see previous? I mean, I, I've seen it for years uh in training camp not as much because he Kenny Pickett was a did a great job of being the humble rookie Mm. he came into camp he wasn't acting like this is my stuff but when he made a play you saw he was it wasn't like he was surprised he wasn't like oh I'm so happy he was he was like (laughs) no 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 that's what we got to do and let's do it again uh there was a there was a there was a touchdown pass that he threw in the preseason where he called an audible to Cam Hayward's little brother Connor Hayward and he was like we wanted to do that because I knew that would work in that moment and he and I have a good relationship those are the things he is bold he will step out on his own I I don't know if you got to see it uh, um uh, Peter but at one point Kenny Pickett, like his first drive, it's fourth and one, like at their own 32. And the Steelers are down four. And Mike Tomlin says, go out there and get it with the sneak. And, and Kenny Pickett got it. And it's just like that swagger is real. That confidence is real. And I mean, there was one play where he threw it to Pat Frymuth over the middle, took a big shot from Quinn and Williams. Mm. And, and as the lineman was picking him up, you see Kenny Pickett look at him like, 
yeah, I can do that. And and, and, he, and it wasn't like a in your face. It was like a I'm not I'm not no punk. Keep hitting me. I'm going to keep playing. And that's the swagger that they wanted. That's why Mike Tomlin loved him. Again, the Steelers. They, made, they kept it very quiet. They did the whole, oh, Mike Tomlin ate wings with Meek Malik Willis because they always wanted Kenny Pickett. I mean, they, do you remember those stories? I mean, I it do. was like, yeah, that's why I'm laughing. And, and they're, they're going to pick Malik Willis. But for five years, they watched Kenny Pickett develop from the young kid out of New Jersey into the commander who of, of, of pit football that threw the most touchdowns in ACC history, breaking Deshaun Watson's record. They wanted that guy who carried himself well, who saw the field well. And I think they got the early glimpses of it against the Jets. He also didn't take any reps this week at the first team offense. So this was just him on a dry run. I know they got the Bills coming up, but I'm very intrigued just to see how he performs when he goes into the week knowing, hey, I'm the starter. Stay up to date all year on the Pittsburgh Steelers by subscribing to Locked On Sports Today and the Locked On Steelers podcast on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for making Locked On Sports Today your first listen. Coming up, what do we make of this year's version of the Baltimore Ravens? Here's what to look for on Bet Online, your number one spot for all your gambling needs. This Monday night football game figures to be close. Bet Online has the 49ers slightly favored over the Rams. It's just one. And the total also pretty low, but that's probably due to some uncertainty at quarterback. Jimmy G, what's up? Bet online has the over under 42 and a half. Bet online where the game starts. Trudging through the rain and facing an early two score deficit did not phase Jalen Hurts and the Philadelphia Eagles, who remain the only undefeated team in the NFL after four weeks. That's a wrap here at Lincoln Financial Field. Your Philadelphia Eagles are 4 0 for the first time since 2004. They are the only undefeated team left in football after a 29 21 win over the Jacksonville Jaguars. It did not come easy. The Eagles were down fast 14 0, but they scored 29 unanswered points. The keys on offense the running game, over 200 rushing yards against the number one ranked rushing defense in the NFL. On defense, Five turnovers, including the game-winning strip sack by Hassan Reddick, gave the Eagles 22 points from turnovers. It was an incredible day. The weather was tough. They were down 14-0. Injuries all across the roster. But this Eagles team stayed composed and found a way to get it done. As I've said, Miles Sanders and this rushing attack, they can be the best rushing offense in the league whenever they want to. And they needed it today in windy and rainy conditions. I'm Louis DiBiase. The Eagles are cool. 29-21 over the Jacksonville Jaguars. Locked on Eagles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. The Dallas Cowboys, led by Cooper Rush, put together yes, that Cooper Rush put together a dominating performance against the Washington Commanders. Cowboys get another fantastic performance from their defense, and they get another fantastic win. Hi, I'm Landon McCool with the Locked On Cowboys podcast, and the Cowboys beat the Washington Commanders 25-10 to at home in Dallas with another victory with Cooper Rush, uh, as Dak said, on, sits on the sideline and gets one week closer to coming back. Huge defensive performance led by Trayvon Diggs, who had two key pass deflections and, and an interception at the end of the half, and just overall dominance on the pass rush that made Carson Wentz feel, feel uncomfortable the entire game. The Cowboys kept the pressure on the Commanders offense throughout the game, uh, with the pe- pressure and then eventually having to stop the run in the second half after giving up some gashes early on. But we're able to hold on and with a fantastic, another fantastic performance by Cooper Rush, throwing two touchdowns, including one to Michael Gallup, who came back on from an ACL injury this game. Uh, the Cowboys offense looks to be rising right where it needs to be. Uh, getting ready for where Dak Prescott will come back from his foot hand injury. For more on the Dallas Cowboys, make sure you check us out on the Locked On Cowboys podcast or on any of the podcasts on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. The Denver Broncos offense has been a mess to begin the season and things may be getting messier. Running back Javante Williams was carted off the field after the first play of the second half with an apparent right knee injury. Williams was unable to put his full weight on his right leg and returned on crutches from the locker room. He has led the Broncos in carries and rushing yards this season while backup Melvin Gordon has fumbled four times, losing two of them, including on Sunday against the Raiders. It is clear the Broncos will need to come up with a contingency plan for their running back room should Williams miss significant time. 
And on the hardwood, the 2022 sixth man of the year is getting paid. The Miami Heat signed Tyler Hero to a four-year, $130 million contract extension on Sunday. After averaging 21 points a game a season ago, the 22-year-old Hero lands an annual salary worth over $30 million for his rookie scale extension ahead of the October 18th deadline for members of the 2019 NBA draft class. Too long didn't read? Hero is getting the bag. Hero is the sixth first-round player in the draft class to agree on a rookie extension. That list includes the top three picks, Zion Williamson, John Morant, and R.J. Barrett. The Baltimore Ravens want to live by the analytics, and that means the critics are going to kill them by the analytics too. Late in the fourth quarter, fourth and goal from the two with four minutes left, the Baltimore Ravens in a tie game decide to go for it. They don't get it. The Buffalo Bills drive it all the way down the field and with time expiring, kick the game-winning field goal, 23-20. They get the win. It's the second time in three weeks the Ravens have blown a three-score lead. Kevin Ostriker joins me from Locked on Ravens, presumably after he has picked himself off of the floor after all of that. Kevin, what did you think of John Harbaugh's decision to go for it on fourth and goal at the two? Yeah, Peter, I'll be honest with you. I was floored. I was absolutely floored that he made this decision. Now, we do know that John Harbaugh and the Ravens favor analytics. They have made that very clear. You go back to last year. I mean, they were going for it when they had the opportunity to tie the game late, you know, 14 seconds to go, 10 seconds to go. They would go for two-point conversions to win those games. And ultimately, they failed on all those attempts. But you go here, Peter, and you have a game that is tied with just over four minutes to go. The offense hasn't scored a point in the second half. They get down and right to the Bills' two-yard line. They do get stifled, but they have the opportunity to at least take the lead. And John Harbaugh, after the game, said that his decision gave them the best chance to win the game. And he might have believed it because I think what he was really trying to say is that he didn't trust his defense. I know a lot of people agree with that. And look, the defense is the game we're on. There were instances, again, we saw the missed tackles a little bit where you just allowed the extra five yards, the extra seven yards here and there. We saw some miscommunication even after the decision by John Harbaugh where the Bills drive down the field methodically and the Bills have an opportunity to go and at least punch the ball in the end zone. But if that happens, the Ravens will get the ball back with time. So what you do do if you're the Ravens, you let them score in that situation. You give your offense time to score. Well, that was communicated to them. Everybody except Dafe Owe, apparently, who he said after the game, the Ravens had a situation where they said either let him score or go for the punch out. Everyone else on the defense let him score. Dafe Owe goes for the punch out and tackles him. The Bills run down the clock, and that's that. So it was it was mismanagement by the coaching staff. It was mismanagement by the players. There's a lot of frustration here in Baltimore after the Ravens blow a 21 point lead to the Dolphins in Week Two. And a 17-point lead to the Bills in week four. You know, it's stuff that doesn't happen to good teams, and especially in the AFC that is so stacked this year that we saw many moves be made. You can't have that happen. So to answer your question in in a short version, I I was very shocked John Harbaugh decided to go for that on fourth down. You you do have to credit John Harbaugh in this regard. If you're going to play the numbers, play the numbers all the time, and they they seem to do that. They seem to be saying, we're not going to just do this when it suits us. We believe that over time, this is an advantage for us. Someone like Brandon Staley did that and now does not seem to be doing that this year. So I, I, I give John Harbaugh a lot of credit for that. I, I frankly was not surprised, but I don't know that it was the right decision. It, it's difficult. Their officiating was also part of the story here. There was um, a, a, I would say, farcical roughing the passer call late in this game as well. That was a big play here. I'm not going to be blame the refs guys, but if you're the Ravens, do you come out of this looking more at the the Dolphins and the Bills games as look, the Bills and and the Dolphins won those games, but the Ravens controlled those games for most of the contests or are you going, man, it really stinks that they cannot finish these games. Which which side of that are you leaning on? I think it's a little of both. And I think when you're talking about the Ravens controlled this thing, then they let, then they let it go. I think you look more to Miami with that mindset where, look, they for the first three quarters of that game, they were in pure domination mode. They had that game in the back. They have the 21-point lead. And then in about a 10-minute span, it just all goes haywire and everything goes down the drain. But I do think, yeah, you talk about the refs. There were multiple calls that went against the Ravens that 
probably shouldn't have gone against the Ravens, but you don't want to put yourself in that situation to have the refs decide a game for you. And for Baltimore, if they had just scored, you know, that field goal or scored a touchdown, they would have been in a much better situation. So you can't, you, you can blame the rest, but you can't blame the rest at the same time. You kind of have to have a balance with it, but look, this team is talented. They have talent on all three phases of their roster. They, they have to put it together quickly though, because week five is not an easier with Cincinnati coming to town. Stay up to date all year on the Baltimore Ravens by subscribing to Locked On Sports today and the Locked On Ravens podcast on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get podcasts. Coming up, why Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs look like bona fide Super Bowl contenders again last night. Now on to Sleeper. Sleeper is the fastest growing fantasy platform today, and they've got new features, including a new over-under game integrated right into your fantasy platform. I use Sleeper for my fantasy football leagues. You probably use them for yours. And you can play their over-under game right where you're checking waiver claims. Is my lineup set? All that good stuff. And the over-under game is super easy. Choose two or more players that you like and pick their over or their under and say, let's rushing yards for running backs. If you're right, you can win anywhere from two times to over 20 times the money you put in. Plus, it's right in the app. You're already using Every week for your fantasy team. So you just, um, I like this. I like this. Like you're already in the app so much. Why not have a little extra fun? And why not have a little extra fun together with our listeners? Because our listeners, we got a new listener group, sleeper.com slash locked on today. And if you go there and join, sleeper will automatically match your first deposit up to $100. Again, go to sleeper.com slash locked on today. And you'll get a $100 deposit match on that first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. There was a lot less on the line than in some of the games Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady have played in. It is, after all, a week four game. But the Kansas City Chiefs were coming off a brutal loss to the Indianapolis Colts. Tampa Bay Buccaneers also coming off a loss to the Green Bay Packers. And it was the Chiefs who absolutely put it on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in a 41-31 game that was not nearly as close as that 41-31 final indicates. Joining me now from Locked On Chiefs, our friend Chris Clark. And Chris, this was a get-right game for the Chiefs somehow, even though it was against Tom Brady and a really good Bucks defense. What was different this week from last week? It looked like to me, at least on both phases, on offense and defense, this team came out and they were attacking. And they were attacking at all levels of the field. They were attacking blitz-wise when it came to defense. Uh, they were shutting down the running lanes. Leonard Fournette had, I think, negative three yards on the night, which is just mm -hmm. insane, uh, especially when you're talking about a Chiefs defense stopping the run that well. And I understand Tampa didn't run it very much, but uh, that's still pretty impressive. And then you look at – what they did offensively, they, I mean, they were attacking multiple different levels of the field with multiple different players. And yes, Travis Kelsey had himself a game, but, you know, MVS had a, a great haul uh, down the middle of the field. Juju had some big plays. Sky Moore contributed as well on offense. And then you look at the running game. They had almost 190 yards against the Tampa Bay Bucks defense. Uh, if you would have told me that Kansas City would run for 190 yards, I would have told you you were crazy. Absolutely. 37 carries, including a couple of Patrick Mahomes scrambles over five yards per rush for the Kansas City Chiefs offense. And I, I guess the question that that is going to be difficult to answer, and if you could answer it, I'm putting you in a difficult spot by even asking it, you'd be coaching the Chiefs probably because Andy Reid would like to know the answer too. But how is this a team that we saw them in week one look a certain way? And then in week two, look a certain way. In week three, like th they have been this sort of roller coaster team this season. Why is that? You know, I look at it's week two differently than a lot of people look at week two. I think the Chargers had a great game plan for this team, and I think they have a great defense. So I take it with a grain of salt with how they looked against the Chargers. Uh, what I will say, you know, week three, I think that they overlooked the Colts. I think that's the reality of it is they thought that they were going to be a better team because – the, the Kansas City Chiefs, they were, you know, 2 and 0 heading to that game. The Colts were 0 and 2. You know, the Colts don't belong on the same field. And that is the way it came across. And then you look at all the special teams' mistakes. They basically spotted them 14 points. Yeah. You cannot win a game if you're going to spot another team 14 points. And, you know, the reality is, is when you look at Kansas City, if they are in a position where their defense holds a team to 20 points, 
there's no chance that they should be losing that game. And they lost to the Colts by scoring less than 20 points. It's just, you can't lose games like that. And, uh, you know, to me, it's just the offense was out of sync that day. And the defense, I think, played really well. Special teams gave up the game. And, you know, it's going to happen. They're going to have those bad games at times. But it looks like they got back on the right track going into this week. Two of the four games so far, they have put up 40 they got to 27 in that Chargers game, that on a short week. Why have they been able to cover up for the loss of Tyreek Hill so effectively this season? I think, honestly, you look at it, and I think that they were always going to be better than people thought that they were going to be because Tyreek Hill is a huge part of the offense. But that's really all they had was Ty- Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill. You take away those two weapons, and they couldn't beat you. So now they're in a situation where Juju is starting to come into his own and they have other guys that are stepping up. MVS stepped up tonight. Uh, you saw Jody Fortson get a touchdown pass. Uh, Noah Gray had a, a touchdown run as a tight end. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, you're know, you not going to normally see those things. And Andy Reid in his bag on that one. Right. And then you see Mahomes doing Mahomes things where he runs around for 40 yards and then throws a two-yard touchdown pass that everybody is sitting there going, how in the hell did that happen? <laughs> and finally, last year was miserable. For the LA Lakers, as it seemed like Russell Westbrook, LeBron James, and Anthony Davis were not fitting together well. With questions all offseason as to if they would fit together at all, they have developed a new mantra at training camp. You get it. Go. I think the biggest thing was everybody trying to be selfless, and now everybody is being aggressive, Anthony Davis said after practice on Saturday. Russ, you get it. Go. Bron, you get it. Go. I get it. And go. Whoever. And that's been very helpful for us. It will also be good because they will get it and then go home during the playoffs because they're not doing that. Thanks for making Locked On Sports today your first listen. Now go find your favorite team's Locked On podcast and make them your second listen. Coming up tomorrow, will the Rams topple the 49ers? So at least until tomorrow, stay Locked On Sports today. Locked On Podcast Network and Odyssey present Locked On Sports Today.